Thank you for double clicking your mouse tonight. You're listening to the Midnight Frightcast in five, four, three, two, one. Hey everybody, welcome to the Midnight Frightcast. This is episode number 84. We are clearly still stuck in this freaking quarantine. I am your host for the evening, for the afternoon, for the day, Greg the Movie Guy. With me is our Scream Queen, Maddie. We better not be doing this into the evening. I got shit to do. Well, I'm just saying for the <laughs> evening. I don't know. Whatever your time of day is or wherever you're watching. We have uh, the other guy in the room, the guy who likes to wash, Josh the Mountain. Son of a bitch. Now it's safe, right? <laughs> And the doctor of everything else is Patrick. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I don't know why I went into game show host mode, but it was kind of fun. So we might pop into that every once in a while. Let's rock and roll with episode number 84. What has everybody been watching? Josh, what do you got? So I have a list of not the of things I've been watching because I, I, I have a list that I've created of things that I need to watch and I want to watch. But I just have not been able to find time to watch a lot of shit because my project list is longer than my movie list. But I did attempt and uh, succeed at watching. Uh, last night I watched uh, 13 Ghosts. I haven't mm-hmm. seen that movie in a really long time. One of my favorite Matthew Lill- Lill- Lillard. Lillard. I couldn't <laughs> say it. Matthew Lillard performances up to an including scream. It says it's a movie that holds up. I really dug it. So I haven't seen it in a really long time. It's a fun movie. It's not, like, the best movie, but it's definitely watchable. So, really, that's, like, the most notable movie I watched this week. I'm going to attempt to get to my movie list this week. Maybe. I don't know. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. That's a great movie. Yeah, it's fun. 13 Ghosts. Yeah, it is. It really is. It's it's creative, and the uh, the ghosts in it are really entertaining Yeah, to watch whatever, what have you. So, Maddie, what have you been watching? I finally finished The Mandalorian, you know, like two years yes! behind the time. Well, we started it, and then I got distracted by Tiger King, as we all did. I really like The Mandalorian. I think it made me a little bit gay, just a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, for, the other th- for, for which character? I can't remember her name, the really hot chick with the, like, short... The super tough one? Yeah. The, the Mandalorian. Got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, yeah, bench press me, girl. Yeah. That was some, uh, de- <laughs> that was some decent casting there. Yeah. Hell yeah, it was. Um, I also watched Get In, which I think we talked about. I eh, wouldn't recommend it. Give it. Uh, skip it. It's boring. I think it would be like an okay movie. I just, I really don't like, pl- they kind of market it as a horror movie and it's not. The article that Josh shared with me was talking about how violent it was, and I kind of, after watching it, was like, have you ever seen a violent movie? Because <laughs> this was not it. There were there have been more violent episodes of Barney than fucking Get It. <laughs> so, mm-mm, I would hustle that one along. <laughs> That's too bad. I was looking forward to that one. Me too. I was like, oh, this looks fun. And I love French movies, so, mm. but yeah, very disappointing. You know, if you're lucky, so, you can also find the sexual episodes of Barney. I don't want to. I'm not. Barney that. sexual episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I think they call that dinography. Didn't we talk about, didn't we have that topic last week when we did F. Mary Kill? I don't think Barney's, I almost said I don't think Barney's in my box and I'm just going to shut my fucking mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Patrick, please help us out here. All right. What have you been watching? uh, What I've been watching, you know, it was kind of funny because when I was editing this last week's podcast, I ran across, we got to that uh, Mary Fuck Kill section of the podcast. And Josh's, one of Josh's picks was the tall man from Phantasm. And I had no idea who the hell that was. Well, two days ago, we're flipping through, I don't know, I think it was Prime or something like that. My wife sees Phantasm on there. She goes, have you ever seen this? I said, (laughs) no. And so she forced me to watch it. And I say forced because that is a horrible fucking movie. And then I found out they made five of them. Yeah. As late as 2016. And the first one was like 1978, something like that. (laughs) So I watched Phantasm. That was a real snore fest. (laughs) 
And it's then I caught Rocket Man. That's not so seen good. it up until now. You know, if Rami Malek got the Oscar for what he did in Bohemian Rhapsody, the guy who played Elton John, I'm sorry, his name escapes me right now, should have at least been nominated. Yeah. But I think he at least deserved a nomination. Probably obviously would not have won up against who was also there because I don't think the story was strong enough. And I think maybe that's what kept them from getting the nomination. Yeah, but he did he did his all his own vocals. <laughs> Um, unlike unlike Rami, unlike Rami Malek did not do any of that, and I thought his portrayal of Elton John was just it was fantastic. it was really good. But like I said, I think maybe it was just the the script itself that the the writing wasn't strong enough for him to get that nomination. And it was really early in the year that that movie it, came out, yeah. and that always hurts a movie. So other than that, uh, today's movie that's it. Yeah. All right. I haven't done much on the uh, the moving watching and uh, still just picking and choosing through the Avengers saga because they're fantastic movies. I love watching those. Um, I did finish the series Hollywood on Netflix. Really just absolutely love that. It was a great show. Definitely check that out. Also pulled the trigger on a new uh, series that dropped on Netflix. That was Space Force. I am two episodes in and I really like it. Good so far. Uh, Steve Carell. You can't go wrong. He's a fantastic talent, and he's surrounded by incredible talent all around. It's just, it's a great show. Uh, definitely give that a watch. Really, the big thing that I've been working on, I'm kind of taking a, uh, a back seat to my, my watchings, is I've been drawing. I started working on a collage, an Avengers collage, because that's what I like to do, and uh, just kind of plugging my way through that every evening. So uh, if you're interested in checking that out, I'm on Instagram. I have a account on Instagram, Greg the uh, Greg sketch guy, check that out and tell me if you like it or if you hate it or what have you. So sketchy Greg guy. Got it. (laughs) Sexy. Greg, the sketchy guy. Actually the the Disney one that Greg did was actually really good. If you guys haven't seen it. Oh, the collage. Yeah. I really like that. That was cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've been taking some art classes at, uh, at Metro because, or for my associates with video and this last class that I took introduced me to some different mediums. So I wanted to do a, a legit collage on something that big of a of a canvas, and it's been it's been a lot of fun so far. So all right, let's keep rocking here and the rolling. We have a topic. We're gonna we're gonna switch to the other side of the spectrum. We went kind of goofy last week with fuck Mary kill. We are uh, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about some serious stuff: sex, nudity, and rape in horror movies. Is it necessary? Is it relevant? Just why? And that's uh, kind of what we're going with. So does anybody have any immediate thoughts on sex, nudity, or rape in horror movies? I'll kind of jump in. Um, <laughs> I've said before, I don't love nudity in horror movies. And it's not really because I think it's like exploitation or anything. I just don't really like where it comes from. There was, in the 80s, there was a lot of, you know, the people who were having sex or the girls who are getting naked or the ones getting killed. And that was kind of a reflection of what the morals were at that time. So to me, like, the whole, like, oh, the naked girl gets killed in the horror movie is really kind of slut shamey, and I'm not about that. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of my biggest problem with it. As far as sex in horror movies, Mm -hmm. there, it's kind of just kind of a thing. I mean, I don't. 90% 90% of the time it is 100% not necessary so I'm like um, as far as rape in horror movies I, it's a tough pill to swallow but it, you know one of the things about horror movies that I like is there is no envelope there's no rules to horror movies there's I'm the movie I'm thinking of unfortunately right now is Serbian film where it's just no holds barred and they threw whatever the fuck they wanted in there and I kind of like that about the genre. So I think they just, everybody's just going to use whatever they can to make this, make the experience uncomfortable for the viewer. And I think that's such a huge part of what horror movies are. I do think when the rape scenes cross like five, six, seven, twenty 20 fucking minutes, I'm like, bro, come on. We, I got it. How I got far, it. How far do you think, I might not be phrasing this correctly, but. How far do you think somebody has to go? Like, how how do you think a director approaches or a filmmaker approaches a rape scene in a movie and why they feel like it's even necessary to put that plot point in? Because in it was a plot point of the one we watched today. Like, I got yeah. it. 
And and it's also been a plot point of other movies that we've talked about as well, such as Revenge. I spit on your grave. Or or I spit on your grave. And when it happens, it's usually a plot point to incite the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. You won't necessarily see rape in in horror movies unless it leads to a revenge. Right. I mean, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of one that that happened and someone didn't excite revenge at the end. The uh, remake, the unextended, or the extended remake of Hills Have Eyes kind of had a rape scene in there that I don't really think was a plot point. It was just happening. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that was, um, and then a Serbian film. That was I haven't seen it. Don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's one I, of no those... I'm shocked that you say that because you had me watch Martyrs. Well, Martyrs is like a good movie, though. Like, and I'm not saying Serbian film isn't, but it's a movie that was just made to shock. Oh, yeah, okay. it's, a, it's like a bond between father and son. It's kind of that kind of movie. It's a bonding movie. Josh. What? Oh. No. <laughs> That's what I got out of it. Sorry, I must have read that movie wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's about a family coming closer together. Yes. Um... um yeah, like, I think if you're going, as I said, like, I think the director today wanted, this whole movie, I think, was about making people uncomfortable. So I think that's why that scene was so graphic and so prolonged. And I have some notes about that when we get to actually reviewing yeah. the feature. But yeah, as... as yeah, you uh, had some time to take notes, right? <laughs> oh, I, uh... Yeah, no, as a plot point, though, I think it can be extremely effective mm-hmm. in these movies, as long as, I mean, have a reason to do it. And in this case, in, in the movie that we did today, if you're only doing the movie for yourself, that's fine, but also realize other people are watching it, and, and if you have to extend it, as long as this, I'll get into it later, for God's yeah. sake. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm just curious, like, obviously people or filmmakers approach those topics separately in a film you approach nudity separately than you approach a sex scene separately than you approach a full-on rape scene right and do you think somebody's more uh more comfortable approaching somebody just to do a, a straight like nude scene versus how do you approach somebody being like all right for the next five minutes this dude's gonna like be doing this and you have to go but to this but as a filmmaker, I don't. It's not necessarily approaching them at that moment for it because they already know what they're getting into. You approach them early on during the casting, and they've obviously read the script. They know what they're auditioning for. They know what their comfort level is. Right. We're supposed to read a script before we go audition. Fuck. Right. Surprise. <laughs> I never read *Eyes of Isabel*. I had. But no yeah, idea. as towards <laughs> as towards addressing it while you're you know, getting ready to film it, I, yeah, you're definitely going to approach it differently. I also think that it would kind of, like, those three different things, I think, kind of would fall into a different category of horror film. Like, nudity and sex kind of tend to be more in, like, the slasher genre. And right. I think rape scenes kind of tend to be more in that extreme genre. Mm-hmm. The rape um, revenge. Or, yeah, either mm-hmm. the rape revenge or going further into, like, because right. um, a lot of extreme horror movies just kind of have rape, and it's not there for any reason. It's just yeah. Look at August Underground. Yeah, like August Underground or any of those other ones. Like mm-hmm. it's happening. I mean, I'm I'm perfectly fine with you know the first two options in a movie. Doesn't I mean I don't look for it. I don't seek it out. I mean, if it's there, it's there. But uh, that last one, that the the rape stuff, like. Just watching that in our current film last night, I don't know at what point Greg shut the movie off, but that about had me last night. I'm just not like, well, I'll talk about that scene, I guess, when we get to the, the <laughs> like. Yeah, it's hard to overlap. do this topic without don't thinking overlap. about the, the, the movie today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just tough to like, I don't know. It's, that's That stuff is tough for me. And, and, you, and even with a warning, it's like really tough. I mean, you gave out warnings last week in... Even knowing it's going to happen, it's just not, yeah. Well, never mind. Save the comment for later. <laughs> yeah, it's tough doing this without... Without, yeah, without refer to this. I haven't seen... Uh, and that's the other thing, too, is I have not seen a lot of rape revenge films. Like, I've seen I've Spit on Your Grave, and we watched Revenge. Outside of that, though, I could not give you any... Well, and I've seen parts of a Serbian film. 
but I have not. Uh, beyond that, I have not seen. I couldn't. T- I couldn't tell you the name of, of another one of those movies. I, I couldn't. I have no idea. So I guess my uh, experience with those is very limited. As I said, I think you're going to see scenes like the one in our movie in. Like, cause even well, I, the remake of "I Spit on Your Grave" was pretty graphic, but um, I think even like in the rape revenge ones, they're not as forced as this one was. That was a horrible term. Oh my god. Anyway, but um, as I said, I think it just kind of depends on what it's being used for, because there is a huge difference between it being a plot point and it being just like a shock tactic. I feel. I don't know. I don't know how you put that in there and not be a pl- like. What example would we have where it's not a plot point in a film? You know what I mean? That is, but it, cause it's kind of there for both, right? It's kind of there, like it. It's a plot point, but it's also well, obviously it, it's that kind of movie as a full-on shock value kind of film, right? Well, you could almost use August Underground as an example for that one because in August Underground there really wasn't a plot to the movie. It was just a collection of videos, a collection of clips of (laughs) two guys doing horrible, horrible things. So in that sense, it was there for shock value alone. It did did nothing to drive a story forward because there was no story. Yeah, and as I said, it's the same thing. I keep thinking of the Hills Have Eyes remake. It didn't, I mean, the guy goes after like the mutant people in the movie, but like not really because of the rape it was kind of just there and i think it was just kind of there as a shock point because it was kind of like there was a bunch of shit going on and then that was just kind of going on in the background yeah so i mean and i think that's kind of the difference between like just sex in a horror movie and rape in a horror movie is like there's oh normally except for as i said i'm not counting like the extremes but there's normally a turning point with the rape scenes there's just sex in horror movies for no fucking reason. Like, no reason at all. <laughs> they're, uh, they're scene breaks. They're like, you know, they're thrown in there to kind of give you a breath between this scene and that scene. They're basically scene breaks. Well, and, and, and some people approach it from the sense of they're in the movie. Not, here I'm talking about nudity and sex. They're in the movie to sell the movie. Right. Yeah, yeah like shit. Definitely, definitely in the 80s. That was a huge selling oh, yeah. point. If you could throw some TNA into a movie that guaranteed that all the preteens and teen boys are going to watch that movie. And I think and, it was probably easier to do it in horror movies than it, and, and well, comedies too, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. It, it almost became expected in horror movies after a while. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's taken advantage of something that probably shouldn't have been taken advantage of. Yeah. And that's that's the one thing that I, I really feel is kind of a slap in the face to the the creative process or the creative team of that movie is, you know, you, you look at those comedies and you look at those horror movies that that is all they focus on are the, the nudity and the sex. It it completely detracts from what the story really is. You're you're saying I don't have faith in what this movie is so i'm going to put this guaranteed money maker so that get uh, guaranteed to put people in the seats into this movie because i know this isn't going to be a good movie right so yeah. here and you it, go and it does nothing to push the story along no yeah. absolutely not and i mean if there's going to be a sec what... if there's going to be a sex scene you can do it tastefully you don't have to unless it's specific to the plot yeah it, it has to be organic it has to fit yeah. within the story and that's right I, i've been waiting a long time to talk on the on the podcast about this topic because one of my one of my biggest things about sex nudity and throwing rape in there is nine times out of ten it does not need to be shown in gratuitous amounts you can you can work around it and imply and let the viewers use their imagination you don't have to show a porn scene up on the screen to help move the movie along i i'm 100% 100% advocate that there doesn't need to be any nudity in films because all it does is detract from what the story is and how it's moving the story forward. Well, and like, here's the thing, like soft core porn exists mm-hmm. and I'm totally pro porn. Like if you, you want to do that, watch that, whatever, but that's a separate genre and it can exist and it does its own thing by itself. And like, mm-hmm. if you need a plot in your porn, like Josh has said, he needs it. Those films <laughs> exist. Like, there is a company, I think it's called Wicked or something like that, that, like, 
basically all they do is just like sexualize like your normal common like movie plot points or there's wicked (laughs) or there's a ton (laughs) of like porn parodies out there of like game of bones is hilarious like love that fucking movie (laughs) but um like i'm just saying like to me porn exists and i think it's it's fine and it is a valid form of entertainment but it's kind of like horror doesn't need help from the porn industry and the porn industry does not need help from the horror industry no it just and as i said i'm going back to where it just came from in the 80s like the horror the nudity was so slut shamey and i'm just kind of like let's leave that back there it yeah it's exactly like what patrick said it it's it was established during a time when it was fairly acceptable and it just kind of has ridden through as now it's a standard and it has to be a part of these horror movies. And I think we've proven on more than enough grounds that what was popular and what made things work back then does not need to be what makes these things work right now. Yeah, like today I'm probably going to get downvoted into the ground for suggesting this fucking movie. (laughs) I I think in the end, for me, I I agree with Josh that if it's in the movie – it's not going to shock or offend me, but it's not something I seek out in my movies. Yeah, like, to me, I'm not going to, like, not watch a movie if there's nudity in it, or I'm not going to not right. watch a movie if there's a sex scene in it, and I'm not going to make a huge deal out of it. But I'm rolling my eyes, like, real hard. And I'm just kind of like, really? Like, <laughs> that didn't need to happen in this movie. Like, what was that movie we were watching? Um, the kind of new version of Frankenstein? John? Oh. Depraved. Depraved. Like that, like, sex scene in the beginning, I was just kind of like, what is this for? Like, they could have easily been sitting there, like, having a glass of wine and eating dinner, and the plot would have moved on as normal. So, yeah. And it's it's one of those weird things, and I'll touch on it, or if I remember to, I'll touch on it when we get to the review, that can be used to really establish the relationship between two people, how much they're in love, how tender Mm -hmm. they are with each other, how connected they are with each other. I can see sometimes where that is, can be effective as it it may come into play later in the movie. Yeah. But at the same time, like, I think you can tell people, two people care. Like I can tell Greg and his wife really care for each other very much. And I've never seen them have sex. Just throwing it out there. No. Like, you want to? I've, I've tried some... real hard to, like, get up on that window. But, like, he's got some bushes up front. Like, it's just fucking hard to see through this man's house. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Like, I don't, like, I can see where you're coming from. But at the same time, I think there are other ways you can show that two people like each other without, like, seeing them bump uglies. <laughs> Maddie, I'll send you some clips. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. Operative word is clips. We're talking like 10, 15 <laughs> seconds. Oh, 15. You're up 10 from last time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing. God. And, and uh, I'll send you my email, Patrick, if you want to send me the clips also. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this is the episode my wife chooses to watch. Oh, shit. Hi, hey. Emily. Hi. I meant yeah, she's, that. She, she's already been commenting in the group. So. Oh, I don't. I will, yeah, I had no idea. All right. No, it, it it all comes down to does it move the story forward? Is it organic or is it put into the story for cheap thrills? You know, I, like like Maddie says, if there's there's a hundred different ways you could work around a sex scene or nudity, but if you have to show it, make sure that it is part of that story. It mm-hmm. needs to be part of that story. Well, and, like, here's the other thing about the needs to be part of that story thing. Like, I think if it really needed to be part of that story, you would not be putting, like, 18-year-old hot chicks with, like, breast implants and, like, a perfect butt in there. You would put, like, fucking Susan Boyle in there and have her stripped down. I'm just saying, like, if you're, like, saying, well, it's part of the story and then you're only using, like, really hot women... I'm kind of like, is it really, or are we just trying to... Uh, Maddie, are you saying Susan Boyle is not hot? I'm just saying she's a little larger and older than a lot of women in horror. (laughs) Maddie, do not not kink shame. I'm not. I'm just saying that, like... (laughs) 
<laughs> if they really wanted to prove a point, they wouldn't just be putting like model esque hot women in their movies to get naked. Right. Especially just because like a lot of people get their start in horror movies, like a lot of big actors have and stuff. And it's kind of like, how shitty is that to like just be starting out in a movie and like the director's like, hey, it's not going so well. I'm going to need you to take your top off. And then you're like sitting there and you're like, well, I want to be an actress. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm going to have to take my top off. And that's, that's cheap. That's so cheap. Yeah. You know, if you, if you have confidence in your filmmaking ability, the writer's ability to create a good story, you don't need that. And yeah. that's, and there's enough terrible. Harvey Weinsteins in the world. We don't need exactly. anymore. Yeah, exactly. And as I said, again, porn exists. It's so accessible. If you want to support local businesses right now, Dr. John's is a locally owned business. Go there, get your DVDs, don't steal things, get it going. <laughs> Dick Picks is also a great uh, great business to support. Yeah, like he does reviews. Like if you are not confident in your porn selecting choices, <laughs> like that man will do a review. He's oh. the hero we need right now. We are towing a line I don't think we want to cross. <laughs> no. Well, we don't kink shame here, Greg. Right. This is true. Right. This is true. All right. Last question I have. Josh. What? Susan Boyle, yes. Barney. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Hang Susan on Susan Boyle in the Barney costume. Hey, Damn it, you the answer. <laughs> there it is. There Great it is. minds think alike. <laughs> I just want All her right. to wear the head part, though. Yeah. And I want her to come out, like, singing the Barney theme song. <laughs> yes. If she can sing very well, yes, she really she talented. is very a ta- she's a very talented woman. Oh, fantastic! Damn. Hang on a second, Susan All right. Boyle as Barney. You know, Josh, as long oh, as you're wicked. writing, as long as you're writing things down, go ahead and add Kathy Bates Hot Tub. Uh, oh, about Schmidt, Master Bates Hot Tub. Got it. There you go. <laughs> if it exists, there is porn of it. <laughs> Probably contact Wicked. All yeah. right. Let's let's move on. I think we we've, we've all touched on our points here. Let's uh, let's jump over to the villain versus villain. Ooh. Maddie, you ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Maddie, pull out that box. Yeah. I expect tips. <laughs> um. Okay. Stay in school. Damn straight. No, we already did him. <laughs> Damien Thorne from The Omen <laughs> versus the Candyman. <laughs> we already did Candyman. We did Candyman for sure. Did we? Okay. Yeah. Then I'm it was. Pick... Uh, Candyman versus Michael Myers. I remember that one. Okay. Well, I am just, like, picking these at random out of a box, so I need y'all to just chill. Okay, Hannibal Lecter versus The Thing. Ooh. And as I said, you can just say who's the who you think the better character is. Hannibal Lecter. I find Hannibal Lecter to be completely fascinating. The character himself and Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of it in Silence of the Lambs specifically. There's nothing really supernatural and natural creature-esque about him. He's just one fucked up individual, but he's mm-hmm. incredibly intelligent and very methodical. So as a character and as a villain, that would have to be Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, I'm definitely going to hop on the Hannibal Lecter train. Um, I think there's also something like almost appealing about his character. He's very charming. He's very intelligent. He's very cultured. And I think he can just like lure people in. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he doesn't like just kill for i mean he kind of does kill for shits and giggles but the fact that he doesn't just like kill people indiscriminately like the thing would and he just kind of like chooses his victims i think that's really cool and i love anthony hopkins so hannibal one's for me go ahead greg all right i'll i'm gonna agree with that i you're talking two different types of, of characters here you've got a creature versus um like obviously it's a man but you know I, I feel like the thing is one of the one of the better horror creatures that we've ever come across, which I think gives it a, a leg to stand on in this in this fight. But aside from being able to conjure different like tentacles or tendons or whatever it happens to create itself into, I think the true horror lies in that psychology of what Hannibal Lecter is. And uh, Patrick, you had mentioned Silence of the Lambs, where is obviously where he came from or where he started. I, I look to Red Dragon where he was working with the the officer and appeared to be one of the good guys trying to help <laughs> locate this other uh, serial killer. 
and knowing exactly where he was going from that exact point, I think is just absolutely, like, like you said, it's fascinating, uh, his character. And uh, Matty, I 100% agree with you. Anthony Hopkins is a stud as an actor. Like, there's nothing he has touched that has been terrible or even, I don't, he's just a fantastic actor. So, yeah, he's and a so good. for me. Yeah, if we were breaking it down, like, film wise, I would 100% go with the thing as far as films go. But, I mean, nothing new to bring to the table. I agree with everybody. Hannibal Lecter is the probably the more fucked up character. Uh, the more interesting, obviously well-written character, or better written character. So character-wise, yeah, Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. But movie-wise, I would go with the thing. Hannibal Lecter for the sweep! All right. Last but not least, we have a movie that we watched. We're going to review it. That movie was Irreversible. And Patrick, you got the deets. I have the deets. Irreversible, 2002, running an hour 37 on Voodoo. Told in reverse chronological order, Irreversible is the story of how one traumatic night in Paris unfolds as a young woman is brutally raped and beaten by a stranger in the underpass. And as her boyfriend and her ex-lover decide to take justice into their own hands and hunt down the rapist themselves. IMDb rating, 7.4. Metacritic score rating, 51%. Rotten Tomato critic score, 57%. And Rotten Tomato audience score, 81%. So it appears that the audiences enjoyed this movie better than the critics did. Nice. All right. Who wants to kickstart us? Well, should we start with Maddie and ask her why she picked this one? Let's do that. Maddie, why did you pick Irreversible? Oh, you know, I like to be sad sometimes. (laughs) I actually picked this because it was a movie I would have sought out when I was younger because when I was younger and first getting into horror I wanted to push myself and see like if a movie pops up and I still am kind of like this if a movie pops up on the hard to watch or like disturbing list oh yeah I am all about this and um this movie popped up on an incredibly hard to watch list, and so I was like, "Yeah, let's introduce some of that into uh, our podcast." Because <laughs> we've been kind of watching like some fun, like creature features and some mm-hmm. shenanigans lately. So I was like, "Yeah, let's let's bring it down to earth and slap everybody in the face." <laughs> the asshole father collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so All that's right. why I chose it. <laughs> who uh, who wants to jump in? Well, I, I watched the movie last night because I knew I wouldn't have time today. It's uh, So I was reading comments while you guys were kind of watching the movie. And, like, you guys were kind of commenting in the Messenger group as you were watching. And Greg made a, a comment about how, you know, is, is the film, like, shot like this? Is it like this the whole time? It's like a super, like, jarring movie. Like, when you first start this movie, it's, like, it's all over the place. There's a scene at the very beginning, end, whatever you want to call it right now. It's completely fucking dark. It's a there's there's light in there, but the camera's moving so much you can't even see really what is going on at all. Um, so like you might as well just sit there and like because I with with foreign films I have a hard time. Usually they have to go back and watch it again because I'm trying to read it and watch at the same time and I can't keep up with stuff. And um, so during that scene I was just reading because I couldn't see anything and. Uh, the coolest part of this movie for me was the fact that it was shot in revert, like end to beginning. Um, I thought that was really cool. It, it kept all the questions going, all the mystery going as far as like who these two guys were at the end, like what were they doing and uh, what were they going for? And uh, it was confusing because you don't really know what's going on. And, you know, you, they put it together and you start to get some answers of as far as who everybody is and everything. Um, and then it got to that, that scene right in the dead center of that movie. And uh, I I think I told Maddie, I, I made a comment, I was like, I almost shut it off. I like That scene went on for f- probably five minutes. Probably at least, I mean, it seemed like a really long time. Maybe it wasn't five minutes. I think it, it was just, almost ten. Yeah, I, I was thinking it was over eight. Oh, really? Okay, so I'm not that far off. But 30 seconds into that scene, I, I got the point. Like, I got it. We could have moved on and continued with the movie and uh i kept waiting for it to like stop and be over and end and it would just would not stop and there's only one other movie where i go that just really pisses me off and i'm kind of angry now like i'm kind of mad and that was martyrs and that's the only other movie that made me 
as angry as I was watching that scene last night. Um, just because it doesn't fucking, like I said, it doesn't end. It just keeps going. And I guess, fuck me for keep watching. I guess I, I'm, I'm the asshole that kept watching it. But, like, I just, I was like, it's got to be over soon. Other than that, it was definitely an interesting choice. It definitely was the most non-safe choice we've made in a long time. But, yeah. I, this is the first time I've ever watched this movie. I've known about it for a while, but, like, I don't know why. It just never really occurred to me that it would be on streaming for reasons. So I, I want to say, first of all, the beginning part of that made me really nauseous. I get motion sick very easily, so I actually just had to focus on the text because I was like, I'm going to throw up watching this movie and I'm not going to be any better than fucking Tiffany from Netflix and I won't do it. <laughs> so, and yeah, I guess some things don't sound any prettier in French because even I at that, like the beginning scene, like the like, even I was like, wow, gentlemen, your language. <laughs> yeah. I, that was, I'm, I'm curious how accurate the English subtitles were to the French. Yeah. Because there were some phrases that just seemed super awkward. I've run across that in actually quite a few French movies, even in like um, Frontiers that we watched. I just don't think French translates super, super well into um, English, especially when you're using mm-hmm. like slang or slurs or whatever else lovely things they were yelling. So I thought this movie was really interesting, but it was, as I mentioned, I've seen uh, the director's other movie, uh, Enter the Void, and I kind of had the same feelings about that one as I did about this one. The whole thing just made me really uncomfortable. But, you know, like, one thing I really like about his director style is he he is kind of one of those almost, like, shock directors where he just he wants you to feel uncomfortable watching his movies and i think he really just hits that nail on the head and um the acting in this i think was kind of fantastic i think i shared with you guys i actually had to turn the sound off during that one scene because it was freaking my dog out Mm -hmm. like i had to like turn it way down because he was sleeping on my bed and then when she started like screaming and stuff he started like freaking out The other thing about this movie is they use, and I don't know what this technique is, but they use a very, very low-pitched sound that's just... Yeah. uh, Like a droning, almost. Yeah. It's it's a background noise. I looked this up with a frequency of 28 hertz that is similar to the noise produced by an earthquake. Yeah. And it's meant to make you uncomfortable. And there's actually a few horror movies that have done this. I think Antrim did this. That's a very interesting technique, and I think it really goes well with this film. As I said, I certainly kind of felt uncomfortable throughout this whole movie experience, and um, that's not something that's easy to do. So, I mean, I'm going to give this movie the credit that it's due for that. For me, this movie was (laughs) difficult to watch for more than one reason. And it was interesting because from the beginning of the film to the end of the film, the movement of the camera lessened to the point where at the end it was filmed almost like a normal movie was. It was obviously on purpose showing the madness of the characters at the end of the story, which was the beginning of the movie, and then calmed down as as time went on. It was also extremely difficult to watch because of the rape scene. And I looked it up, and and yes, it was between 9 and 10 minutes uh, for that rape scene. And it was incredibly... It was done so well, and by well, I mean realistically that, God, it was just so incredibly difficult to watch. And I was like, Josh, I was almost ready to turn it off. I said, how much longer can this go on? And Maddie, you did warn us. You said it was a prolonged rape scene, that you had heard about it, and that it was a prolonged rape scene. I didn't think it was going to be that long. Yeah, uh, I should have probably said, when I meant prolonged, I mean like 10 fucking minutes. <laughs> and And not just a rape scene. Rape is violent enough as it is, to follow it up with her getting the shit kicked out of her. Right? Yeah. The way she did. And for me, it was probably one of the most, I'm not going to say the most shocking thing that I've seen in a movie, but the most difficult thing that I've ever seen in a movie. I thought the acting in this movie was really, really good. It was very realistic. And the reason it was is because the director or the writer only had an idea of the movie. Almost everything was improvised throughout this entire movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. 
Yeah, and and it helped it to have that frenetic feel at the end because they were reacting and acting naturally. They weren't trying to remember lines while they were doing it or, or, or just regurgitating something somebody else had said. These are things that these people would actually say. So I felt that added to the realism of this movie. In the end, though, you know, Josh, you said you were intrigued by the fact that, it, you know, it was backwards to or the end to the beginning. Right. For me, I felt it would have been more effective the other way around because after, I will say the the party scene, after that, I just didn't care because I'd already seen the things that mattered to me in this movie, that something happened to someone and they did something about it. Once that was done, I didn't care about the front end of the story, which in this case was the back end of the story. I didn't need to know their love story in order to know that he cared about her. Yeah, I think they definitely could have shortened the back half of this movie a little bit. Like I, like Josh, I did like that it kind of went back to front because you're just thrown into this like chaotic mess. Mm-hmm. Well, there, there's times where definitely I'm like, yeah. I, I want to know what led up to this. Yeah. But maybe, Maddie, you're right. Maybe it just needed to be shorter since this movie was, a, what, an hour and almost 40 hour, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Number 37. That they could have cut out 10 minutes of it and still had a highly effective movie. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, definitely a couple of scenes in there that didn't, they didn't need to have in there. Well, the incredibly elongated discussion in the subway wasn't probably necessary, but I'm wondering if they did that because they had to wait till the next stop. Yeah. It's just well, fill conversation until this thing stops. Did this Was this movie also shot, like, was this a single shot film? There, there, there were cuts in the movie, but were there cuts in the movie? Because, like, it seemed like every time they went to the next scene, they just kind of rolled up into the ceiling or rolled off of something, and then it kind of came back into the next scene, but without an actual cut. They they were doing cuts. I'd read that. I, I don't have that note in front of me, but they were cuts that were digitized to look like there weren't. Mm. Okay. And also something else that was interesting is that this entire movie was filmed in chronological order and then just reversed in editing. Edit the backwards, it got you. Yeah. That kind of transition style, I think, is just kind of this guy's signature because I've I mentioned the movie Enter the Void is filmed a lot like this movie. I do think that movie is back to front, but like the rolling um, scenes and everything is definitely really present in there. I also felt that that first scene was completely unnecessary. The two guys, the old naked man sitting on the bed talking to some other guy mm-hmm. who's talking about how he slept with his daughter. Yeah, what was that? That had nothing to Fuck do with no. the rest of the movie. That was completely unnecessary. And that was five minutes dialogue right there that they could have left out of the movie. Right, yeah. Yeah. They, ne- they never came back to that at all, right? That was nope. just a rando scene. That was yep. in the- yeah. Right. yeah. So I did not finish this movie. I hit that point about midway through the the rape scene and i just i said i'm i'm done i i can't do it anymore and well, the i don't ironic, want to try and just go ahead i was just saying the ironic thing is once you get through that scene like the rest is kind of smooth sailing well and i'll i'll get to that point too because i've been thinking about that and i i don't want to try and justify it not that i i just don't want to sit there and man up and take it but i think most horror fans most horror watchers have a a breaking point and i feel like this i found one of mine um you know i i don't frequent watching rape movies if i do again it's it's one of those rape revenge where i want to see some justification like the movie revenge she did she definitely got her her justice in that which was satisfying i don't know if i want to say that that's kind of a terrible word i guess but it just it got to a point in there where i was just like i I don't need to see any more of this. And because of the way that it was shot, I felt comfortable turning it off at that point because I didn't need to know what happened at the beginning or at the end of this or at the beginning of this, whatever have you. I know what happens at the end of this movie. So technically I kind of saw the entire thing by only seeing half of it. All I'm missing is a little bit of story story progression. And at that point I got all I need. That Um, front half is good though. That front half is pretty good. It's the safest bit of the movie i and i i imagine it is but even still you've already given me the climactic moments that this movie is going to drive to i've seen what happens i see where this guy goes and i see the end of that and okay that's fine i also feel like if you watch the front half of that movie that stuff that happens in the middle and towards the end is even a bigger punch to the face because you don't know those characters when all that shit's happening to them but you get to know those characters at the front half, 
And to me, it's a bigger kick to the head knowing these people now and then going back and going, that's the shit they just went through. Um, and, and that's that's fine and great and all. I just don't care about those characters at all. It just it did not sit well with me. I think the biggest and the hardest piece of this, because it was shot backwards, I think it was it, it detracted from what the story was. Had it been a normal beginning to front, I think I would have, I don't want to say enjoyed it, but I think I would have followed it a little bit better. Throwing us right into the middle of that with that fucking gyro cam was an immediate turnoff for me. Like, you can barely see anything. There's not a lot of talking going on. And the fact that I'm getting, like, legit nauseous watching this thing because they won't hold the fucking camera still, why do I want to watch the rest of this movie? And I think that was the hardest part for me, especially being on the cinematography side, is I want to see the beauty of these shots. I want this story to paint a picture for me. I can't, I can't get a picture of this when the camera's sitting here doing this thing. In, in fairness, there's nothing beautiful going on. Yeah, no. No, that. I understand it's, that. I don't mix. understand that. Oh, so <laughs> ugly. And I, it is chaos. I completely understand. I understand why they did it. I, I respect why they did it because, yes, you get thrown into absolute chaos. And that's what the camera is supposed to do. It's supposed to be almost like a character showing you what the – what you're – you know, it's another view of what you're watching, obviously. But if I can't make heads or tails of what's going on, it really takes away from the story for me. And I think that's exactly what this one did and why I didn't have a problem shutting it off. It's because a- at that point, I don't have, I don't care who these characters are. I understand that they're pissed off. I understand why they did or what they were going to do. Or This is tough to talk about because it's in reverse order. Yeah. Yeah. I understand what they started with and that slow progression of where they got to where they were going, I guess however you want to state that. But there wasn't a lot of story to really grip me at that point. And then you throw in a 10-minute rape scene, and again, that's just my breaking point. I can't sit there and watch that. And I, I do want to give a shout-out to Monica Bellucci because holy fuck did she sell that. Yeah. Incredible job. Incredible acting. Disturbing as all hell, but incredible acting. And Patrick, you were talking about the that subway scene you are talking about earlier. That's the scene where they're, they're sitting on the, the three of them are sitting on the subway together, and they're Talking about like they're talking uh, about why she couldn't have an orgasm with the one guy, but she could with the new boyfriend. I would have never cut that scene. I thought that was one of the best scenes in the whole movie. I, 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 the dialogue is where like the dialogue in that scene was the 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 best dialogue. From I just thought it was really interesting. It didn't drive anything, but the dialogue uh, was interesting, and it kind of broke up some of the other stuff. Going yeah, on. I, I was just saying, if I had to cut something, I would have cut that. If gotcha. I if I had to take like ten minutes out of this movie, I would have cut that. Gotcha. I would have shortened that shortened that party scene, maybe because yeah. we got it. Like she's dancing, she's there with an ex. You meet her now boyfriend. There's a thing going on. They have a little bit of a fight. They leave. Whatever. Like that she that that scene probably could have been shortened and tightened up a little bit. Like you got to the end of it before. It yeah. was done. Um, yeah. but I will say, however, that I I thought the kill in this movie was great. Yeah. The how they switched between the actor and the prosthetic. I didn't see how it happened, but it happened. Oh, the yeah. kill at the end beginning. There was, a, there was a definite cut, and I think they just they started off with him holding that uh, that. It's but they, but they never left his face. His face never left the screen. No, that's what I'm saying is that's where yeah. the cut was because you saw him pull back and you can see the face as a rubber prosthetic or whatever. As soon as he pulled that back, you could see it, which I agree. All, it was a great cut. You didn't, you didn't yeah. lose anything at all. That's also where they use that darkness to kind of mm-hmm. hide yeah. that cut. Yeah, they I used a little sense. bit of CGI to cover it as well, according to the, the trivias. So. Yeah, I think going back to what Greg said, I mean, I would not think anything different of anybody who turned this movie off at that point because it, no. there's a reason that this movie is on the hard to watch list. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. it is hard to watch. I also think that, I mean, this director is not a huge director, he has not made a ton of movies and i think it's because he has a style that's his own and i don't think it appeals to a wider audience i mean rape scene aside his like (laughs) style does not appeal to a wider audience and i think that's Mm -hmm. totally fine like i would suggest people check out enter the void because there's a scene in there it's filmed in like first person 
and there's a scene in there where the character, which is like you, gets shot and it's and dies, and it's creepy mm. because you're like you're basically watching yourself like get shot, and it's like such a disturbing like, sequence and everything, and like. I watched that movie years ago and it bothered me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like them holding the camera on a fucking like loop and going like this or how the fuck they shot that. That was r- I understand why he did it, but it was it was rough. As so this guy just mm-hmm. has a definite style. It's not going to appeal to everybody. Right. That's probably why Irreversible is never going to be shown on cable TV. TBS featuring Irreversible. <laughs> right? PBS presents brought to you by the letter T. <laughs> All right. Anything else anybody wants to say before we rate this? Just a little bit of trivia. Uh, after yes. doing some research on the movie, we already talked about the background noise of that frequency. Uh, it causes nausea, sickness, and vertigo. And it was added with the purpose of getting that reaction. The director had only a three page draft before the movie was shot, so all the dialogue was improvised. Newsweek reported that this was the most walked out of movie of the year. The director had admitted to taking cocaine while filming the scenes in the rectum. (laughs) And when I say the rectum to the listeners out there, that was the the gay bar was called the rectum. (laughs) Not That That is a great name for a gay bar. Like, I'm sorry. It's horrible, but it's great. So he was, he was doing that. The actors completed. Okay. At the rape scene. They did six takes of the rape scene over two separate nights. And the only constraint that they had on them, apart from the beginning and the end, which was defined, was that it did not run over 20 minutes. Oh, oh, good. We could have gotten a 20 minute. No. I hope he bought that woman a fucking steak. That must have been horrible to film. Let's see what else. I already said that the film was shot in chronological order. According to a 2018 article, the director doesn't give a damn about the viewer's reaction. He said that he never thinks of an audience when making a film. The focus is always for his own enjoyment. I don't know if you guys noticed this during the scene, during the dance scene. Somebody asked Marcus what his name was, and he said, Vincent. And they said, oh, really? He goes, no, I'm just kidding. It's Marcus. Well, Vincent is his real name. He answered truthfully when they asked him what his name was. But he didn't want to kill that long take. So then he threw in the ad lib of, no, I'm kidding. My name's Marcus. And then the blood on Alex's face and the visible genitals on the rapist, both towards the end of the rape scene, were added digitally afterwards. Nice. That's trivia that I have for Irreversible. Good for that director, though. Like, good for making movies that appeal to him and not, like, catering to... Because, again, the movies he makes, that can't be easy. Um, and you can sit there and question everything while you're making that movie. Uh, but good for him for, for not, you know? Yeah. I feel like like Rob Zombie kind of reminds me of that. I feel like he makes movie. He knows who his audience is. Mm-hmm. He makes movies for that audience. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't know if he's doing cocaine during his scenes. Sometimes I think so. Probably. <laughs> I don't judge. I don't judge. So... As Josh sits over there scratching his fucking nose. You want to tell us yeah. about the cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't handle it. I'm not going to mm. lie. I would die. I don't think I could get it up my nose. I have such bad allergies. Like, I would just, like, it would look like I was eating a fucking donut, like, all the time. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're talking about, officer. It's Krispy Kreme. <laughs> All right. Well, we rate on three separate categories. That is the fear factor, the gore score, and the overall, and would you recommend to a friend? So, fear factor. Josh, what do you got? I mean, I was never really, there's never like, there's no like real fear in the movie, but I'm going to go with a three. Call it, call it, call it. Um, We've talked about movies before where there's no like fear, but there's horror in the situation. Yeah. And for that and for how uncomfortable this movie is, I will give it the highest score I've ever given. I will give this a six. Patrick. Yeah, and, and Josh, I, I think you should be allowed to reevaluate that score because I'm going to follow Maddie's way of scoring this and saying about how uncomfortable it made me instead of how right. fearful I was. Right. And I'm I'm going to say at least a seven because I got to say this is probably one of the most uncomfortable movies that I've seen in a very right. long time. Josh, you want to retract? Yeah, I mean, situational fear, you're you're right. So I guess I, I didn't uh, 
really put that in perspective when I was thinking about like yeah. fear of the movie. Yeah, because if we were gonna if we were gonna you know guide someone to whether or not to watch this movie, I would say fear is low, like a two. But right. how uncomfortable you feel and how squeamish you feel, it was pretty high. It was like a seven for me. Right. And yeah, this is a shower movie. You watch it and you're like, I need a fucking shower. Yeah. <laughs> Based on just that, I, I probably shouldn't rate this because I didn't finish the entire movie. But given what I did see, this is a this is not your typical horror movie, but it is a horrific movie. And I think for that alone, and just sitting there anticipating the rape scene, and then watching as much as you can through it, if you even get through the entire thing, I think a seven or an eight is where this needs to sit. It's it's brutal. It is they like they they don't lie. It is brutal. So gore score. Josh, what do you got? Uh, just for the well, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the seven for the gore score. Okay, so. Daddy? You know, I don't think there's a ton of gore in this movie, but it is violent. This is a very violent movie, so yeah, it's sitting up there at a six. Patrick, I would put it at about the same. Once again, saying not a ton of gore. You know, maybe the the head smashed in was the gore, and that was about it. But the violence in it was really, really high. Seven, eight, just for the violence alone. For me, I'm, I'm sitting at a nine. I mean, this is probably one of the, the toughest things that I have ever watched. And again, it's not the the bloodiest, but that scene is just, it's it's brutal. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It is a brutal scene and they do not pull away or do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, would you recommend to a friend? I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a seven. If you can make it to the, the, the back half of that movie, I would give it a seven. And I'm going to say yes on the recommendation, but again, I'm going to say make it to that front half of the movie. You, you got to crawl through some shit to get to it. But if you can make it to the front half of that movie, there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of beauty on the other side. So I'm going with seven. Yeah, I'm also going to sit at a seven. Um, this is a movie I never need to watch again. As Greg, you said, this isn't as much a horror movie. It's a horrific movie, but it really takes a lot to make me uncomfortable anymore. So I, and I think this movie deserves the props that it gets, you know, real life can be brutal and to show that on a horror movie and make it so realistic and so believable is something that needs Mm. to be, you know, commended. I would recommend this to someone, but I'm not sure who, like, I would (laughs) not recommend this to like your basic horror movie viewer who's just like, well, I just watched the first Friday the 13th series last week. I wouldn't be like, guessing this much. <laughs> this is not a starter pack movie? Yeah, no. Oh, God, no. It's not. This is like, I would have put this up with like Serbian film martyrs, even maybe August Underground, although just in the violence category. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd recommend it, but you have to be like seasoned horror viewers to watch this. Patrick. I, ooh, this was not a horror movie to me. This was a drama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a thriller. But it was still an effective movie. I'm going to give it a seven. Would I recommend it to someone? Probably not. Because I don't know if I'd want to put someone through what I went through watching specifically that scene. Unless I knew that they were looking for something specific like that. Like if they're doing research on women in horror, how they're being portrayed, <laughs> violence, rape, that type of thing. I don't, I, I don't see myself recommending this movie, although I thought it was a very effective movie. Yeah, I would definitely, like if I did recommend this movie, I'd definitely be like, just an FYI. Yeah, there's yeah. uh because i mean you have no idea if someone's been like sexually assaulted and might get like that, fucking ptsd <clears throat> from this movie because right yeah so i would definitely be like you know what this is an uncomfortable effective or drama but just an fyi this is going on in there so uh overall i will actually for what i saw the the half of it that i saw i would give it a five i i agree it is it is effective for what it's meant to do I feel like you uh, you're you're getting a lot with what you with what you're going to watch, and uh, again, I haven't seen the back half of it, but there are those that can power through some of that stuff. I just was not one of them, but I still feel like it was effective for what it was trying to do. Um, I do agree, Patrick. Not a horror, a thriller, but it's it's a horrific thriller. 
Yeah. And I think that's what crosses it over into that horror genre. And as far as recommending, there will be a lot of uh, just an FYI. This is probably going to happen. You may walk out of this one and you're going to hate yourself for it. So it depends on who I'm recommending it to and how badly I want them to hate themselves. <laughs> so next week, Serbian film time. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's jump classic. right into that one. <laughs> Just keep going. None of, none of the rape scenes are anywhere near as long. It's totally fine. Yeah. It, oh, good. It's pretty quick. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> quick and over. All right. Anyone have anything they want to plug before we jump the gun and get the heck out of here? Um, I'm trying to think. I really haven't frequented any small businesses lately, which I feel bad about. But um, keep shopping local. Anybody else? No plugs here. Not yet. No. For all you filmmakers out there, there is a film festival in uh, Seward that we're still trying to get off the ground. If you have a film, please still do to submit. We are planning on hosting it until otherwise notified. Uh, and even if then, we may do a digital film festival. But still submit your films. We're, we're happy to play play them if we can. So that's the uh, Flatwater Film Festival. I probably should mention the name. That would help. <laughs> Otherwise, Patrick, take us home. Yes, if you're a fan of the Frightcast, we know that you are. Help us out. Make sure that you head on over to iTunes or whatever platform you happen to be listening to us on and make sure that you rate and review us. Also, help us build our audience. Tell all your friends and family about us and make sure that they listen. You can check us out on all the social medias. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram and, well, Facebook. Just look for Midnight Frightcast. And finally... Check out all of our films at MidnightFrightFilms.com. All right. This has been episode number 84. I've been your host, Greg, the movie guy, with Josh, Maddie, and Patrick. We look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to keep this going as long as we can or as long as we're isolated. Shoot us a line. Jump on Facebook. Jump on Twitter. Jump on uh, whatever the other one is that I can't think of the name of, Instagram. And uh, if you've got a movie you want us to check out or if you've got a topic you want us to touch on, let us know because we're kind of running low. <laughs> <laughs> um, Obviously, we played fucking Mary, fuck, kill, or whatever the fuck last week. Right. Oh, right. but it was fun. <laughs> it won't make us do that again. <laughs> yeah. That is a threat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'd love to hear from you. We, we know you guys are out there. We know you're listening, and uh, we, we want to know who you are. We want to know what, uh, what we can do to help you listen to us more and more importantly, to tell your friends to listen to us. So I've been Greg, the movie guy from the Midnight Frightcast. We will catch you next week. Have a good week.